Hello and welcome to live with all my favorite Inkshares authors. That's what I'm going to call this series now. <laughs> I'm your host Regina McMenemy and today I am talking with Christopher Huang. Wait, no, I got it wrong. Huang. Huang. I wrote it down and I still That's said close it. Enough. It's good. Okay. <laughs> General bar ballpark. <laughs> Uh, all right, how are you doing today, Chris? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Great. Good. I'm glad to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, delighted to hear a little bit more about you and your book today. So um, let's just jump right in. Why don't you tell us about your book um, and give us a little summary and a little background information about the book itself. Um, all right. It's a murder mystery. It's entitled uh, Murder at a Veterans Club. So uh, it takes place at a gentleman's club. It's uh, 1924. Uh, it's like you know, five or six years after the after the First World War, the Great War, as they would call it. Right. Um, uh, so, um, so you've got basically got this club full of war veterans. Uh, some of them a little. Some of them more affected by their experiences than others. Uh, it's a time when you know the whole concept of post-traumatic stress disorder is you know just being dis uh, discovered and looked at and investigated. Right. It uh, was even it was kind of called shell shock back then, right? Before yes, they had like yes, PTSD. They, yeah. Yeah. Yes. In, in fact, I think that's if I ever referred to to it in a book, I think I actually actually referred to it as shell shock mm -hmm. or war neurosis, as uh, yeah. I think it was beginning to be called as well. Um, there was a time when people actually thought that you actually needed a physical head injury for um, to ex to you know experience the, these things. So that so that's a bit of the backdrop. Um, you get a new member to the club. Um, you know, think, um, he he meets people. The next day, he's dead. Mm. So the so. first, so it's like he's a brand new person, and then he's just gone. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, they, they 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 find him. They find him in the vault underneath the club. Um, our hero, uh, Eric Peterkin, um, uh, this discovers one of the uh, discovers the uh, the police inspector who's uh, in charge of the uh, um, investigation, uh, actively suppressing evidence. So he decides to take it on himself to investigate. Yeah. Okay. So there's a little sort of rogue detective work going on here. <laughs> well, of course. Uh, you know, the mo I've always found that you know uh, you you have the most fun with uh, with detective stories when uh, when it's uh, when, it's, when it's an amateur. You know, someone who could be you or could be me. Um, right. Not not an official trained person. Right. Not the person who's supposed to be e exploring or or um, doing the detective work or being. Um, responsible for the story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> does it give you, does that give you more license as an author to sort of mess around with things? Uh, a little bit. Um, you see, uh, part, of, part, of, part of, you know, writing with, uh, with an amateur detective is that num number one, um, you're not really confined by uh, by police protocols or you know, all those right. things that are put in place to make sure that the police don't actively suppress evidence, for example. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, as someone who is not uh, a member of the police, um, you know, it's you're more dealing with stuff that you yourself know, right? And um, and and this is part of why I, I said it way back in 1924 as well. Is that, uh, I mean, if you've watched watched uh, television and you know CSI and you know, all all those um, true crime programs, uh, you you see that the you know the police have a lot of stuff in the arsenal these days. That uh, and, and you know you you commit a crime and you know police uh, the crime scene investigation goes in. They dust the, they dust around and you know. Very very quickly, you know, you, you come up with uh, all this evidence that says that oh, you know, he did it, right? Um, and if you want to concentrate on the puzzle aspect, you know, you that kind of gets in the way. 
<laughs> it's like you know you, you just have you just you know pl- plug in your, your your things abc and uh it's too quick it doesn't give you the the thrill of discovery that goes with a good detective story so something like something like that yeah 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 i can see that i think that's one of the reasons why i tend to not be as attracted to uh, those shows like i i think the one i've watched the most and the longest was bones and the reason why i, I the the reason I initially started watching that show was because um, because of Bone's character alone, mm-hmm. um, because there was a female you know uh, forensic anthropologist as the lead. I was like, well, that's pretty cool. Um, but I don't I don't generally find shows like CSI or anything as attractive as I might have. Like I used to love the old um, Mother She Wrote. Uh, I am Runner, she wrote, yes. <laughs> yes, I, mean, I love those. Um, I was thinking of um, uh, Sherlock Holmes, um, and I can't remember uh, the actor who played, not um, Basil Rathbone, but, oh God, I think it was the 80s, Jeremy something. I can't think of his name. Anyway, I used to love that series um, because they were recreating the the feel of that era and it, it, you know, was kind of separate from the technology that we have now. And I think that ga- gave more um, excitement to the stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. It was, uh, yeah. The, the, the whole t- technological thing has made a huge difference in, you know, in what we can find out and what we can know from a crime scene. So, yeah. Well, I'm sure it helps to have put it in a in a past time era to mm-hmm. to be able to build from that. Is that an yeah. era that you were like interested in and intrigued by before, or did you pick it out for the book specifically? Um, a bit of both. Um, I, I picked the 20s because, uh, well, the 20s and 30s have uh, generally been regarded as the golden age of detective fiction. That's when uh, Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers, and a whole lot of um, of you know. People who are considered the top of the top of the field were most active. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was um, it was after writing for a little while that I realized you know you know that, you know with the proximity to the First World War that brought in the uh, the whole post traumatic disorder thing. Interesting. So that was sort of secondary to to the setting. Literally. Yeah. Um, okay. Initially, and and you know as as it grows, you know you you mm-hmm. you start to realize uh um, what a big thing this this thing was back then it was this like this elephant in the elephant in the living room, as they say, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like that that idea or that concept of what we take for granted now, understanding post traumatic stress, um, not just from war, but from all kinds of different things and how how events do um, traumatically impact people. Um, it was definitely something that wasn't understood. Yeah, not yeah. quite a hundred years ago. <laughs> no, not 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 quite. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's and of course, you know, murder mysteries they, they never come one at a time. I don't I don't think there's uh, the, there's any well known detective who's only ever showed up in one book. Right. So so I'm kind of envisioning this expanding out into a series. I don't really want it to. To be a sequential series where you know you where you know if you don't read book one you're lost in book two, right? I'd like to have a sort of a uh, sort of thing where, um, where you can pick out any any book anywhere and uh, and it and it'll still work. You know, still know what's going on. You still know know who's who and whatever. Right. And another, yeah, and another thing I had in mind was was in just spanning this guy's life. You know, from from 1910 to 1980. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just uh, romping around in, uh, in, you know, in history. Seeing where it takes up. you and yeah, seeing yeah. his experiences. Yeah. <laughs> that would be cool. Like to take a character and, and, and kind of play back and forth with their history mm-hmm. as you were creating the story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, course, right, yeah. Go ahead. No, it was just a comment about writing in non-chronological order. That was actually going to be kind of my question. Like, is it, because I I write, I write memoir, right? So (laughs) I'm, I'm, I'm not writing it in any kind of um, 
chronological <laughs> thing. It just kind of jumps back and forth from wherever, um, really wherever my memories uh, kind of light back to. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a lot of, I, I actually am keeping a record right now and kind of like keeping track of, okay, now this chapter has to come before this one one because you reference it in this chapter like so I'm kind of keeping I'm trying to keep like some sort of semblance of order I'm really not very good at order <laughs> uh, <laughs> at all <laughs> so that kind of organization is uh, something that I had to kind of learn um, when I wrote you know the only other book I've written was my dissertation and that had a very set format and the first chapter did this the second chapter did that and you know up through the five chapters they all kind of had their thing that they did and I wrote them all separately but they each had a a purpose so I already knew where they were gonna go and what they were gonna do this is like a, a completely different life of its own so in you writing about a character in a non sequential non chronological way is that easier for you as an author or harder? Is it more freeing or more constrictive? Do you have any kind of... Um, I, I personally think it's... Maybe a bit liberating, I think. I, I, I would lean towards that direction. Mm -hmm. Because, um, like I said, each book is supposed to stand, you know... On its own. On its own. It's, right. a, it's a discrete thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know, so basically, you're really just picking up this character. You know, you know what he's like. You don't need to know what's in his past because that's it's not relevant. relevant to the story, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. There, there, there. I mean, there, there are there are certain you know background things that you've decided you know as you go along. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, presumably, you know, when you get to Several books down the line, you uh, you're going to have to remember that. Oh yes, you know, back in this book, you said that you know that he grew up here, and back in this other book, you said that yeah, you know, that this and this happens. Right. You still have to keep um, um, true to to the story as you're telling it. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> so are you going to make a big map? <laughs> no, happening? I I think just a general idea of of you know of of the guy's lifeline is probably enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a, a, the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that'll help. That'll help. So you mentioned um, Agatha Christie, and I'm assuming she's one of the influences for you as a, yes. as a writer. Who else? Yeah. Who else um, do you feel has impacted or is an influence for this book? Um. It's mostly it's mostly been Agatha Christie. Um, I'm I'm not sure if I can really point to any Anybody one else, else? say you know they that you know they were a uh, specific influence. Mm -hmm. um, I was charmed a lot by the whole concept of the detection club as it uh, existed back then. There was a a club formed by all these people who were writing uh, detective stories. Um, Dorothy Sayers was a very well-known member. Um, I actually picked up one, uh, one of her books, Five Red Herrings, and I, which I'm kind of in the middle of right now. Mm. So, um, What's it called, Five Red Herrings? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I thought it was, it was, uh, for some reason, I thought, I thought it was a collection of short stories, but, but no, it is actually about... It's an actual novel. Uh, yeah, it is an actual novel. It's about, um, it's about, uh, it's about a painter who get um, who, who gets murdered, and um, there are six possible suspects, five of whom are clearly red herrings because they're innocent, and it has to be mm -hmm. one one other person. Right, right. Well, that's the um, the structure. I mean, there's certain conventions with detective fiction, right, in terms of yes. like. Um, uh, throwing someone, throwing the reader off the trail. Uh, that was yeah. one of the things I noticed. One of the reasons why I stopped watching Bones. Um, sorry to keep coming back to it, but it's <laughs> like sort of my main reference here. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the reasons why I stopped watching it was because once I learned the the pattern of how they would introduce the person who had done it early but quickly dismiss them mm -hmm. as not a suspect, um, then it took kind of the enjoyment for me watching it out because 
I was always like, oh, well, it's going to be that person because they dismissed them so quickly. <laughs> and it wasn't always the case. I will, you know, they, they definitely didn't, you know, always follow it. But for the majority of the episodic stories, it definitely followed kind of a rigid mm -hmm. uh, set up. And I was always just kind of like, oh, well, never mind. <laughs> I, um, I think I've seen just one episode ever. And yeah, that happened. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah some, guy, some, some guy came on, they talked to him a lot. Mm -hmm. he, he had this... He was very well characterized, and then he went away, and I thought, yeah. <laughs> 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 He's coming back. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You're like, uh, you know. And at first, you know, I'd say, at first I didn't pick up on it, and I did watch it, and I was like, oh, wow. And then all of a sudden, it just, all the pieces clicked together, and it's like, oh, okay, so this is how this goes. Uh, and then ever every episode after that, I'd be like, okay, it's going to come back to this person. And... Um, <laughs> So when it didn't, that's actually my favorite season of the show is when they had a, an overarching arc, story that ran through the whole season and it ended up being somebody completely different who you didn't expect and who you actually really liked and that um, was heartbreaking for everybody involved. And so that like transcended their genre that they had even designed. So I, I, I think that sort of formula might be specific to... Um, to episodic TV, TV series, yeah. You know, well, one thing is, you know, if you if you happen to have a guest star, you're not going to give him to give give his role to you know to some nobody, right? You know, it's yes. got to be somebody somebody important. Who's more important than that guy who actually did it? Right. <laughs> uh, um, I remember one of Agatha Christie's things. I, I think she mentioned it in an autobiography or something. Was that uh, she always wanted to put a lot of suspects in? Uh, and I thought with I thought with mine that I didn't put in that many because I actually just started off with you know with with an idea of you know the these these the six people you know, mm -hmm. by uh, the the five members of the uh, um, the five board officers as it were of the, of the club who are actually governing the place and uh, and then you know you throw, throw in a few a few of their hangers hangers on and uh, expand a bit more and then and you know and people and I've had at least one person say that you know, you know there are a lot of people here right <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know I think that's okay I think I kind of like the having to suss out from a lot of characters yeah. <laughs> rather than too limited uh, uh, yeah selection I, I guess I guess there there has to be a balance that you've got to hit somewhere you know mm -hmm. between too many and too few yeah yeah if you get too focused it doesn't give you enough um, fodder to write about um, too much would be overwhelming for the reader potentially to track mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's cool um, so we talked a little bit about authors inspiration let's talk a little bit about your your process as a writer what um, how do, how do you go about like getting started on a story or started writing? Um, well, there are multiple ways. Um, the, uh, the method that has worked for me most so far is um, basically uh, first uh, collecting a group of characters you know, and just pushing them all together into the same place and seeing what plot emerges from, uh, from these characters interacting. And uh, the easiest way of doing that, I found, is uh, basically to go to different people and ask them each to supply one character, a known character from uh, history, literature, pop culture, whatever, and, uh, and use that as a starting point. You know, usually I found that the, the less I know about the character I'm given, the better. Because right. uh, then I just go to Wikipedia, I, I pick out a few a few articles about this person, and say, "Oh, okay, I'm gonna weave I'm gonna weave a new character out of these elements here." Uh huh. Oh, that's awesome. That's I love that idea. Like just as a just as a concept to take, you know, random characters that you're given and then to uh -huh. build from that. That's mm. fun. Yeah. yeah. I'm always thinking, I teach creative writing online, so I'm always, <laughs> I, there might be a little um, self-service going on <laughs> here in terms of like. Oh, that's, hmm. that, that, that's fine. Did you, yeah. um, uh, it, one, of, one of the ways it's helped is uh, 
this method of help is that you know you have this ready-made idea of how how a character is going to act. So you you know right. you them all together, you see how they, how they act. And number two is um, okay. I lost my train of thought there. Oh, uh, so you're talking <laughs> about um, yeah. Uh, it gives you ready ready set like a ready-made um, plan for like how they act, and then you put them together, and then see how they interact, and then you yeah. know, off from there. And uh, um. Does it get? I, I'm sorry, I've probably, I've probably lost my my second point there. That's okay. That's okay. Does it get complicated trying to um, to create characters that way, and then imagine how they're going to interact with each other? Like, if you have too many characters that end up being too similar or too different, and they can't, you can't um, figure out a way for them to relate. Does that ever happen? Well, um, one solution is just to combine characters. Uh, there, there was one time uh, someone gave me. Nancy Drew and Veronica Mars. <laughs> well, they're like the same character. <laughs> well, yeah, so so um, so they did become the same character in the in the story I wrote. Ah, yes, exactly, because they're like Veronica Mar Mars is a direct sort of descendant. Yeah, just like kind of Buffy is too. They all I would throw them all in the same character pot. <laughs> <laughs> With the Scoobies and you know, like the small people supporting, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So my my wild card question that I'm asking all the authors I'm talking to is, mm -hmm. um, it was funny because when I had Robert Batten on, he was talking about how um, he doesn't really have a lot of time for other hobbies right now, other <laughs> other than mm -hmm. writing and promoting the book. And I have mentioned extensively what how exhausting it was to run a campaign. So. Uh, <laughs> I know you're you're in the throes of your campaign right now, but um, what is your favorite geekdom, or what what's the geekdom you're spending the most time in right now? Um, I would have to say interactive fiction. Okay, so interactive fiction in um, what kind of definition? It's a fancy name for uh, for um, text adventures. Ah, yes. Like, you know those okay. computer games from the eighties where you know you um, you know you. Zork. you yeah, Zork. Zork, you know, you're west of a white house, there's a mailbox here. Yes. You, you type open mailbox and the game says, you know, you open the mailbox, there's a leaflet in it, and so on and so forth. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, people, um, you know, people are still, write, still writing these things. It's, a, it's very much a hobbyist thing. Uh, we're actually um, coming up towards the end of the annual interactive fiction competition at the moment. Oh, I had no idea. Interesting. Yeah. I'm gonna have to look this up now because I, I, <laughs> like that was my start. Huh? Zork was my start, one of my start beginning of of gaming for me, and I played, I played so many versions of Zork. I played the original text versions, and then when they moved into um, the visual versions, like they had um, an alchemy based one, and they had Grand Inquisitor, and I mean, I played tons of Zork games, and um, I've wanted to play, I haven't, because I haven't really had a whole time, a whole lot of time to game, um, but Telltale does similar kind of storytelling, yep. interactive storytelling now, so I had no idea that it was like there was a competition, though, is it text-based, or is it still mostly, is um, it more, mostly story, or is it also visual? It's, um, m most of what you get is text-based, there's also a lot of uh, hyperlink-based fiction, and, uh, and then there's choice script, which is more of a choose-your-own-adventure thing. Okay. Um, uh, some, some people, you know, who have the, the chops do it, uh, they do the, they do, um, they add visuals um, to, to the works, so uh, uh, the competition these days uh, is um, quite a lot more varied than it used to be. I've been following the competition for close on 20 years now. <laughs> so, awesome. Do you write in this? Is this also something that you write? Uh, yes. Yes, I have. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I, uh, I wrote three short uh, interactive fiction games um, set in the, in the world of my, of, of my novel. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, wait, I remember seeing that. Sorry, I, I'm so distracted. Um, it's the end of the semester for me, and everything happens at the same time. So I remember seeing this. You had posted about it. <laughs> I remember seeing. I'm going to have to share these. Okay, so I didn't realize, though, that they were interactive fiction stories based on the novel. I knew they were games based on the novel, but I didn't understand the connection between Oh, I'll fix that then. Yes, I'm all excited now. I'll have to make sure to share those links when I put this up on the website so that yes, people can go do. and see them. Yeah. 
That's so cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I geek out too. That's the whole purpose of having the geek embassy. So I have a place to geek out and uh, now I'm all excited for you. So is, are these stories part of the competition that you're talking about? Uh, no, no, okay. no, they're not. Okay. They're just part of the, they have, they've been, they've been part of the campaign. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Very uh, cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I might enter again next year. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I should hope so. I should hope so. All right, so give us the lowdown on your book and your campaign and what you have, um, what um, time you have left and where everybody can find you and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, uh, Murder at the Veterans Club. It's on InkShares. Um, you can go to InkShares and search for it. Uh, there's, also a web, there's also a website, um, www.peterkin-investigates.com. Oh, that's awesome. So you named the website after the character in the book. Yeah, because I figured that, you know, if, you know, if I'm going to have a second and a third and a fourth book or, and so yes. on and so forth. And... Yes, it needs to have its own empire. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> awesome. And you have um, 80 or so days left in your campaign? Uh, yeah, about, okay. about 80 or so days. I still need to get about 300 more orders. All right. All right, 300 more orders. All right, people watching, go and order Murder at the Veterans Club. Um, I read the first, I only read the first chapter. I know there's three chapters that you can read on the campaign page. I read through the first chapter. I was totally hooked into it. So you guys need to go check it out. Um, detective fiction reminiscent of Agatha Christie. Um, interactive games you can play set in the same environment. I mean, come on, guys. This is like every wheelhouse of the embassy in one campaign. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for chatting with me, Chris. It was a pleasure. Oh, thank you for having me. My pleasure.